Now, um, <clears throat> in 2013, the day we live in, you know, a lot of people don't treat coming to church or being in church as very important. A lot of people think that, oh, it's not that big of a deal, and there's all these different types of excuses not to come to church. There's people, you know, I mean, I'm busy, I've got work, you know, there's no church that's really good enough, or whatever, you know. Some people like to say, oh, well, when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst, and just say, okay, well, when I'm gathered just, just with some other people who are saved, then that's our church. Even though there's, like, no real Bible study even going on anyways. But even if it is, it's a Bible study, it's still not church. And I've even heard, I was out sewing, and I've heard recently, and, and it's just kind of weird, it kind of struck me as a little bit weird, more than one person, a few people have already told me, like, well, you know, the end times are here, the, the, you know, the world's going to end soon, and just, I've had it with churches, and I'm done, and just like, you know, they're just waiting for the end to come. And, and, and what we see here in Hebrews 2, look down at verse number 23, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So here, it's saying, as you see the day approaching, look, you need to be in church more, so much the more as the day approaches. And it was just, just kind of odd. I heard people thinking that, like, well, they're, they're getting out of church because they think the day is approaching because the end times are here. And... Um, but the Bible's exhorting us here, and, and it's going to be real stern, too, because, you know, it says here first that we need to consider, consider one another. You know, a church is a congregation of people. And you don't have to turn there, but there's in, in Hebrews 2.12, the Bible says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And that was a quote from Psalm 22.22, which says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. The Bible interchanges the word church and congregation. Congregation is just a group of people meeting together. It's, you know, the congregation that is the church is, is Bible-believing Christians, people who have received, who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, those that have been baptized and just um, are, are typically part of the church. And, those, and, and the congregation is a, is a congregation of believers and your know, church isn't just about one person. It's not about just the pastor or whatever. A church is about everybody. It's a whole group. A whole group makes up a church. I mean, ultimately, a church is about Jesus Christ, but, but it's, the focus should never be on just one person in a church because it's everybody. And that's why it says in verse 24 there in Hebrews 10, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So, you know, part of the reason we come together in church is to provoke one another unto love and to good works. You know, you're going to need that encouragement, that edification that you get from other people within the church. You know, you make friends, you get to know people a little bit, and that's going to rub off on you, and that's going to, you know, impact your walk with Christ. And that's one of the reasons why church is so important. And it says, you know, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, not forsaking the, not forsaking the congregation, as the manner of some is, there's a lot of people that that's just their manner. They don't want to go to church. They, you know, they, they have other things they want to do. But it says, exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see a day approaching, it's so much more important to be in church today than it was five years ago, and ten years ago, or a hundred years ago, because the day is approaching. It's getting, we're getting closer and closer to end times, and we know that perilous times are going to come. We know that tribulation is going to come upon us. It's going to be a great tribulation. You're going to need church more than ever during those times. As the day is approaching, man, you need to make sure you're in church more and more. You're going to need to know, hey, these are, you know, these are some Christian friends that I have. These are people I can rely on. When things get really bad, you know, these people can help to lift me up you know, spiritually or even help you out physically if there's other needs that you have. These are people that you're going to be able to rely on and help you in these times of trouble. And they're going to be able to encourage you to live for God, to do good works, and to do the things that we're supposed to do. Because I'll tell you what, if you're out of church, most likely you're going to be around the world. And you're just going to be around people of the world and other people who, aren't, who don't have their mind focused on Christ and don't treat church as being important. And that's going to rub off on you. And I'll tell you what, your walk with God is going to, is going to start to stray. And I know, this, I know this firsthand from experience. I mean, I got saved when I was 20 years old. And yeah, I got saved just like anyone gets saved. I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was it. He sealed me with the Holy Ghost and it was a done deal. Now, a little bit, I, I tried to, to, to get into church a little bit, but 
I didn't really stick with it very long. And I'll tell you what, when I got out of church, I was thinking like, well, I don't need to go to church because I could just read the Bible. I'll just read it for myself and I'll understand what it says. I don't need to go to church. And you know what? That lasted for about two days where I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to read the Bible on my own. And I started reading the Bible and it just stopped. And, you know, the flesh, I, I was still really worldly. I, I liked doing a lot of the partying and other things I was doing. And you know what? The Bible reading got less and less really fast. And the way that I was living my life before was just exactly the same way I continued to live my life. And it continued that way for years and years and years. Yeah, there were some times where I thought, you know what? You know, I really got to get back into the Bible. I really got to, you know, study. I really got to learn this. I really got to improve my, my relationship with God. And, 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 you know, it's heartfelt, honestly. And I'd take, you know, a night, again, it would last maybe a week. I'd be like, okay, I'm really going to dig into the Bible and I'm going to read. Again, without anyone else around, when I, I was forsaking the assembly, it doesn't last. And those types of things, I mean, all it takes is this one thing and you're out and then you, you don't even think about it again. You get distracted with the cares of this world. Now, church is extremely important for many reasons. We're going to go through a bunch of them. We're just going to explain why the church is so important. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Well, no, don't turn there. Turn to, um, turn to Acts chapter 20. In Matthew 16, Jesus Christ, um, I'm going to start reading verse 16 for you guys. We're turning to Acts chapter 20. The Bible says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Jesus Christ founded the church upon the rock, upon himself. Now, the Catholics will get this wrong, and they'll say that Peter is the first pope. He's the father of the church. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, they'll try to say that, you know, they're popes, you can't be married, and all this other stuff. Peter was married. That's why it says that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law when she was sick and had a fever. And um, Peter was married. We're not Catholic. You know, a Catholic, the word itself means universal. And I, when I grew up in a Presbyterian church, and I had to learn and recite, the, it's called the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. And it's just, we believe in God the Father, you know, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his, uh, you know, the whole thing. And I, I don't remember all of it verbatim, but I know a lot of it. And, and part of it, and I always thought this was weird, but I never understood. I didn't even know what the word Catholic meant or anything. It says, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. In, the, in that Apostles' Creed, that as a Presbyterian, as a Reformed Catholic... We were supposed to, to memorize and recite this and chant this as something that we supposedly believe. The word Catholic means universal. I'll tell you what, the universal church does not exist. That's why the Bible over and over again refers to churches. The church at Galatia, the church at Ephesus, you know, the church at Thyatira, the church at Smyrna. All over the place, there's individual, unique churches that all have elders and bishops that, that, that operate and, and help to run those churches. And... We do not believe in this, in this Catholic, in this universal church. And there's so many movements today out there that are trying to, to bring everyone together under one big umbrella and basically just make one big church and just say, well, you know, we're all Christians, we're all saved, so we're all part of a church. No, that's impossible just knowing the definition that we already went over earlier, that a church is a congregation. Now, the only way you're going to have a universal church is if everyone in the universe was gathered together in one place. That would be a universal church. So this doctrine is a false doctrine out there trying to just do this ecumenical, just bringing everybody together and, um, and really bringing in, you know, um, ties that, that don't, don't belong there, they don't exist. You know, we have, a, we have a local individual church and not until we're all gathered together in heaven or Jesus Christ comes down the rain is when we're, is when we're really going to have all the believers together in one place and have that, that complete church. So that's just a false doctrine. It's a Catholic doctrine, and we, we reject that here. Now, you're in Acts chapter 20. Look at verse number 28. Just to show you the importance of, of church, Acts 20, 28, the Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock 
over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ purchased the church with his own blood. The church was so important to Jesus Christ, he shed his blood. Yes, he shed his blood for our remission of sins, but he shed his blood, he purchased the church of God for himself. It's extremely, we shouldn't forsake that. Don't take that lightly, that Jesus Christ shed his blood for the church of God. And, it, and this is an exhortation to the overseers. It said, the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. People are supposed to come into church and be fed. And, and what it's talking about, it's not just talking about you know, food. It's not saying, oh yeah, here's, here's a hamburger. You know, We're not feeding you food. We're feeding you with God's word, with the manna of God's word, with the bread of life. The Bible has those words, and, and you know we, we don't even necessarily have to understand it, but there's definitely a reason that God has an importance on the church, and that people that come here are supposed to be able to learn from the preaching, from God's Word. And you know, when you're going to church, there ought to be a lot of Bible being used, because that's where the truth is coming from, and that's what's going to really feed you and help you to grow as a Christian. Now, the Bible says that the church is actually a body, and Christ is the head. In Ephesians 1, you have to turn there. In Ephesians 1 verse 20, the Bible reads, Which he wrought in Christ who, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And uh, go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter number 1. It says in Ephesians 1, it says that basically he's given to Christ. He's given to be the head over all things to the church. So the Christ, Christ is the head of this church. And the church, it says, which is his body. So the church is, is, is part of the body of Christ. So when you come here and you, and, and you gather together with believers and you congregate and you listen to the preaching, we're part of the body of Christ. We have, we have the Holy Ghost living inside of us. Jesus Christ lives in your heart. And when we come together here, we make up the body of Christ. That's, what, that's, that's what the church, part of what the church is for. Jesus Christ is the head. He's the one given the directions. He's the one that has all the wisdom. And he's the one that directs us. And the body, the rest of the body is, you know, the arms, the legs. These things are the ones to do the work. We're here to do the work for Jesus Christ. We get our marching orders from God. We get our marching orders from the Bible, from the head, from Jesus Christ. And he tells us that we need to go out and do the work. And in order to do the work, we need to clean up our sinful lives and do, and do the things according to the Bible. So we come in here, we come into church, we get edified, we hear the directions from the head. And we can go out and do those things that we need to do. Look at Colossians 1, verse 18. Again, it's the same, the same thing. Verse 18 of chapter 1 of Colossians, and he is the head of the body, the church. Again, emphasizing the body is the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now skip down to verse 24, because this is the Apostle Paul speaking here, that he counted it, he was happy, and here he's rejoicing in his sufferings for the church. Look at verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul's counting it. He's rejoicing and he's happy that he's able to suffer in order for the, for the benefit of the church. Now, Paul thought it was that important that you know, it didn't matter what he went through. It didn't matter the, the afflictions that he was suffering and the pain and the things that he had to endure because he's helping out the church. And you know what? Not everybody has that same attitude. Some people come to church and just, you know, just give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. They just want to be fed and go home and do whatever. But, you know, in, in order to be, um, you know, a proper member of the church, you know, we ought to all have Paul's attitude here to where he's rejoicing in his sufferings, and he's going through sufferings. Obviously, if he's rejoicing in sufferings, he's going through something. And he's going through sufferings to, the, um, to be helping out the, Christ's body, to be helping out the church. And the, you know, that's the way we're going to have a great church, is when people are coming in and looking out for one another and willing to go through pain and affliction, maybe, to, to, to better 
Christ's body to better the church. Now, another aspect of the church in Ephesians 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without men, and amen. A lot of people like to say, well, we're living in the church age. And they'll say, you know, it's dispensational, and people of the Old Testament were saved through their, through their sacrifices and the, the, bull, the blood of bulls and of goats, and that now we're in the church age, and then the end times is going to be another age. That's nonsense. Verse 21, Ephesians 3 says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. All ages, the church was made for all ages. Those in the past and those going into the future. Even Moses was in the church in Acts 7, uh, verse, 30, uh, verse 37 says, that this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. He's prophesying of Jesus Christ. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. So if we're in the church age right now, only in the New Testament, how is it that Moses was in the church in the wilderness? The church was for all ages. The church was, is, is supposed to be throughout all ages. And the church um, will always be. It's a congregation of believers, people who believe in the Lord, people who believe on Jesus Christ. Now that's just a little bit of a history and, and just kind of explaining why, um, you know, from the Bible, how God views the church and how Paul viewed the church. And, you know, Jesus Christ founded the church with his blood and he found it out himself. And he loves the church, and it's part of his body, and he wants you to do better. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, people give an excuse of not going to church because they can't find a good church. And they'll say, you know what, I, I want to go to church, I'd like to go to church, but I can't find a good church. Now, I'll admit, yes, you do have to have some kind of minimum criteria to finding a church. We all ought to have that. You, shouldn't, you can't just go into, like, you know, a Pentecostal church where people are, are flopping on the ground and rolling in the aisles and, and don't have the Spirit of God in them because they believe in a workspace salvation. You can't just go to a, a place where a bunch of people are meeting. If the people there aren't saved, that's not church. I mean, it might, say, it might have the word church in the name or it might say the word church on the outside of the building, but it's not a church. A church is a congregation of believers. So the first the first piece to probably the most important thing for a church is obviously make sure that they're right on salvation. In order to find a church that you need to go to, they have to have the gospel right. It has to be salvation by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And that, you know, you can never lose your salvation. That's, that's critical. That's key. Otherwise, you don't have a group of believers to congregate with. The, the second thing that I look for is that since the, you know, church is supposed to be a place for learning and perfecting of the saints, and it's something where we go a place where we go to learn, you need to have the Word of God. You're not going to be able to learn without a Word of God. That's why we put so much emphasis on the King James Bible. The King James Bible in English is the Word of God. And this is something, if you're an English speaker, you shouldn't go to a church that doesn't use this, because if, you're, if they're using some other book, it's not the Word of God. This is the Word of God preserved for us today in 2013. It's God's perfectly preserved word. We have it for us today. And I'm not going to get into all the, all the reasons why. It's a whole other sermon. But if you have doubt about that, you can come and talk to me about it. I can show you all the different places in the modern versions where, uh, not all of them. That would take way too long. I can show you some of them. Because it's all over the place. I mean, the, 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 the whole Bible, the whole books are different. I mean, you look at them. You can do this on your own. Take one book of the Bible and just start going through it. Any of them. Take any book of the Bible and just start going through it. And see if you can follow along, go side by side and read it, and you'll see how vastly different they are. And there are many places where the, where the differences, you know, some places you can like and say, okay, well, it's really not that big of a deal. And it's not. It'll be minor things. But then you can look at other places where it's like, well, no, where it says that you're being saved as opposed to, to just you're already saved. That's a big deal, and that changes, and that corrupts the Word of God. So we need to look at this. We need, we need to make sure that the church we go to is using the Word of God in order to be fed. And the third thing that I look for in a church is that they do some kind of soul winning because the church is also for the work of the ministry. It's something that we need to, to be doing work and um, going out and getting our marching orders. 
We need to win the loss. It's, it, you know, the church itself is going to die if you're not reproducing, if you're not going out and getting new souls saved and, and, and reaching more people. You know, the church is, yeah, great, okay, you're all believers. But if you're not bringing in new believers, the church is just going to fizzle out and die. And that's not a place where you're going to want to be. You want to be in a church where that's, that's doing the work for God, that's going out and ministering and doing what God has for us. Those are the three things I look at. I'll tell you what, that is not a very difficult list to find. Maybe there's some places in America, I'm sure, where, um, you know, smaller communities, smaller towns, where you really just have a hard time finding this. But if you can find at least these three things, you know, maybe they're off on some doctrine. I'll tell you what, it's not worth... I, turn back to Hebrews 10, if you will, because I, I forgot to point this out. Go Turn back to Hebrews 10 if you're not there already. It's not worth it to forsake the assembling over some smaller issues. If you got believers there, if you got people, you know, they got the right Bible and they're trying to do the work for God, okay, they're, 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 they're going the right direction. There might be things you disagree with, but if you at least got those three things, it's not worth just forsaking and say, well, I'm not going to church anywhere then because, you know, they believe in a pre-trib rapture and I'm post-trib and I just can't listen to it and, and I don't want to have anything to do with that, that pre-trib nonsense, so I'm just not going to go to church. You shouldn't do that, and I'll show you why. In, uh, in Hebrews 10, verse 25, where we saw not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Look at verse 26, and this is often used for, to preach on other things, but look at that first word, for. For if we sin willfully, now that's a conjunction. That's saying, okay, we just got done saying not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Then it says, for if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that these verses are listed right after he said not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. He links them together and saying, look, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Despising the spirit of grace. You know, it's because this is talking about someone who's saved. It says, wherewith he was sanctified. Someone who is sanctified. Someone who's washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. When you don't come to church, when you don't go and be a part of the church and be a part of the ministry, you're saying that you're trotting underfoot the Son of God. The Son of God shed his blood for the church. The Son of God did these things so that we can have this church, that we can be part of his body. And when you're not in church, you're not, you're not part of the body. You're not part of the body of Christ in that sense when we're gathered together. And it says that you've done despite in the spirit of grace. So it's not worth it over a few, maybe the smaller things. If you can't find the, you know, the, a great church, but you at least got a few things there. Hey, don't despise the church of God. Go be a part of the assembly. You know, try to stir people up. Maybe do some sowing, do some work for God. You know, you can still learn. If the Bible's being preached there, if they've got the King James Bible, and if someone's there with the Spirit of God, you're going to be able to learn. It's going to be profitable for you. It might not be the best church in the world, but it still could be profitable for you. You shouldn't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. God treats us very seriously. Now go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 13, because... You know, once you find a good church, now if you, if you have absolutely no church at all in your area whatsoever, you can't even find those three basic, you know, limita uh, um, requirements. And, you know, make up your own requirements. Those are the ones that I use, and I think and I think there's very good reason for those. I think that's a, you know, it's pretty solid, and um, I don't think you'll go wrong if you use that as, as, your, as your template to find a church. But if you don't even have that in your area, you're either going to have to drive pretty far if you can or try to move to get to a good church. I mean, church is important. Church is extremely important. Church is more important, you know, worshiping God and serving God and laying up treasures in heaven for God is way more important than anything you can do in this lifetime here as far as, you know, moving for a job, but, but you're moving to a place that doesn't have a good church or, or whatever it may be. I mean, there's lots of reasons why people decide to move and pick up and move and I think the best reason to do that is, is to get involved with a good church. Get involved with someone where, where you're going to be stirred up, you're going to be edified, and the people there are going to help you to grow in the Lord. And 
you could be laying up for yourself treasures in heaven that is going to last eternally. And a, the, a good church is going to help you to do that and help you to grow and help you to, to do more for God. Look at Matthew thir uh, 13, look at verse number 3. This is a parable of the sower. It says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And Jesus Christ explains this. Jump down to verse number 20. It says, But he that received the seed into stony places, this is what we were just finished up reading there in verse 5, the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So they heard the word of God, and they receive it. They get saved. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 21. It says, Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. If we don't have a good, solid root, we're just going to be just pushed over, we're going to be plucked up, it's just going to be, we're, going to, we're, we're not going to be able to stand when those persecutions arise, because I'll tell you what, tribulation and persecution is going to arise because of the word. Because of the word's sake, the, the Bible offends a lot of people in this world. And when you decide, you know what, yeah, I believe the Bible, and you get saved, you put your faith on Jesus Christ, the more that comes out in your speech, the more you learn about it, and, and it comes through in your actions, and people start to notice that, the more you're going to start experiencing persecution or tribulation, you know, whether it be friends or family members, co-workers, whoever, start to notice, and they'll pay attention to that, and the devil's going to try to get you out. He's going to try to get you to stop growing, stop learning. That's why it's important that you need to get rooted. So it says here the reason why the people, you know, the, the seed that was sown in the stony places, the stony places, of course, is hard to get root. He's, he's, he's using this parable to explain you know, a real phenomena of sowing literal seed with, with people who um, hear the word of God and get saved. You know, if you don't have deepness of earth, if you don't have a root, it's going to be easy just to get knocked over. <clears throat> and it's, you know, if you think about a plant, right, because you, you're starting with the seed, and that's what this par parable is all about. You start with the seed. Now, the seed is going to be very susceptible to the environment. If you just throw the seed on the ground, you know, that's why when you, you know, we uh, planted grass in our house, you know, you're, you're, you're covering the ground with, with tons of seeds. Not every single one of those seeds is going to take root and actually, you know, become grass or become something else, right? Whatever, you're, whatever it is you're planting. That's why you're, you throw a lot more seed than you actually plan on getting because not all the seeds are susceptible to the environment. You know, birds are going to come and eat them up, you know. There's going to, whatever, there's a lot of things that can happen, not enough water, not enough sunlight. All kinds of things will happen so that the seed doesn't actually grow into a plant. But now a lot of those seeds will, they'll start to grow. And they might start to take root, but they're still very susceptible. They're, you know, they're young plants, they're just going to start any little thing. I mean, you step on them, you know, an animal comes by or whatever, walks all over them, that can ruin it and that can, and that can mess it up and then they won't end up growing to full development. But then some, like as in the, the parable here later on, it says, you know, those that grow fall into the good ground, they grow up and they bring forth fruit. So <clears throat> you need to get the roots digging down, and the, the more the roots dig into the ground, the stronger that plant becomes. You're getting more nourishment, you're getting fed more. As the roots dig down, you're getting more, you're growing, you're getting bigger and bigger, and then eventually, with enough growth, that plant will be able to reproduce again and bring forth more seeds so that the, the process can, can return again. And this is a good parable for us as believers because you, God likens the word of God as a seed. It's something that you receive in your heart. Now the devil comes before you even believe. He tries to take that seed away, just like a bird comes and eats those seeds on the ground. The devil doesn't want you to get saved. But once you do, when that, when that word, you believe on, on, that, on the word of God, and it starts to take root in your heart. And a lot of people, a lot of things are going to come and try to ruin that and, and mess up that, that, that seed that, that has been planted and that started to grow, that, that the new spiritual being inside of you that, that needs to grow in the Lord is going to, you know, a lot of things, a lot of outside influences are going to come to try to, to, to mess that up in order to make sure that, that you're doing the best you can for that, for that seed, for that new life inside of you, that new spirit. 
You're going to want to be around the right people and you're going to want to be getting fed with the right nourishment from church. You're going to be not only from church, but also in your own Bible reading and prayer time with God. And all these things are going to help to strengthen and to build and, and to build those roots down. And you ought to find a good church where you can just get planted in. It says in Isaiah 37, 31, I love this, I love this, um, this quote. It says in Isaiah 37, 31, And the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. The only way you're going to be able to bear fruit is when you're rooted down. We need to be rooted down for one, first and foremost, in God's word. And his word is to be rooted in that and founded and, and be... Because when you're unrooted, when you're rooted, think about it, you're going to be unmovable. You don't want to be as a weed that has very, very, very little roots, not very much at all, where you just, just go, boom, pluck them up. You find these weeds, yeah, they grow up real fast, but there's like, there's nothing to them. You just pull them right out of the ground. You want to be like that oak tree, that root structure that goes down into the ground and just, and just goes unseen. You know, you can't see it from, the, from above the ground, but man, those roots go down. You can't move those things. I mean... You need a ex ex tremendous amount of power force to, to try to uproot a big tree like that. And that's the way we need to be on God's word and in church where we get rooted in place, we get grounded, we get settled and say, you know what? I'm going to have my roots down so that when, when the persecutions come, when the tribulations come, when the trials come, when people come and try to, try to bad mouth and say, oh man, you go to that church? They, they believe, you know, thus and so. They, they believe that, you know, Sodom should be put to death, for, you know, do you believe that? Do you believe what the Bible says about that? Do you really believe that? And a lot of people are going to say that they'll get they'll get offended, they'll get scared, and, and back off and be like, no, you know. And they don't want to they don't want to face that persecution because they don't have root. You don't have a root in the Bible. You don't have root in church. You know, you ought you ought to be strengthened and nourished in the Word and and get to the point where your root is down so much that it doesn't matter what people say. You could you know the the the. The storms can come, and they can beat against you. The trials and tribulations can come, and you're not going to move. Right? I mean, a big, se severe thunderstorm, a brand new plant that grows out there, even a big enough storm can, can be enough to wipe that away because the roots aren't growing down deep enough. You just get a little, enough water flowing or whatever can, can just carry that plant away, but it's not going to do anything to that big tree, to that big root structure. We need to get those roots down. Now, church serves multiple functions. One, it serves for edification through fellowship. Again, I spoke about this earlier where you meet people, you get, you get to be friends with people. You edify one another because you're of the like mind, you're of the like spirit. You both believe the Bible and you kind of can help each other because we all go through high points and low points in our life. I mean, different things happen to us. You might be going through a hard time. Hey, the people in church are going to help you with that. You're going to be able to feel better and just be comforted through... The, the friendships and then the fellowship that you're going to have at the church and, and where you're interested in other people's lives and, you know, maybe someone else is going through a hard time. Hey, you want to be there to help that person out because, you know, a lot of times they're going to come back and help you out too. The, the, another reason for church is to sing praises unto God. Hebrews 2.12 says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. We read this verse earlier. Will I sing praise unto thee? Church is a, is a place for singing praises unto God. God loves it when we sing praises unto Him, and God commands us even to sing praises unto Him. The book of Psalms is actually a song book, and it's the biggest book of the entire Bible. God wants us to sing praises to His name. He expects that. He wants us to do that, and He enjoys hearing it. And I, I, I don't know exactly you know, what He thinks, but I imagine that it's got to be similar. I love to hear my little girls sing. I love it. I, I love it. Like It doesn't matter if they can carry a tune. That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. I just love to hear their voices just singing, especially when they're singing like Bible hymns and stuff like that, when, when they do that. And sometimes they just make up songs and they're singing. I love hearing that. You know what? I think God lo looks at us similarly. Because if, you know, if you're saved, God's your father. Just like I'm the father of my daughters, God's, God's our father. And we're probably like really little children to him. <laughs> the amount of wisdom and knowledge and power and everything that he has. I mean, we're like, we're like really, 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 really little Really little babies then. And I just know that, you know, I experience a lot of joy with my children singing. And I, I can't imagine that God, God would also, I believe God also has that same type of joy when, when he hears us sing praises to him. And we exalt his name. I, I think he loves that. And, and, and you know what? If God gave you your voice. It doesn't matter how well you sing. I think God just wants to hear your voice. 
He wants to hear you singing praises to his name. So don't worry about whether or not you have a good, a good voice. When you're in church, you ought to sing. We, you know, we sing praises to God, and it's important. Fourth, um, well, actually, no, thirdly, um, church is a place to pray. Mark eleven seventeen says, And he taught, saying unto them, it is, not, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. God's house, the church, the church of the living God, is a place where we should be able to go to pray. And that's why we also do public prayer here. And then, number four, you know, learning God's word. It's extremely important that we come to church to be able to learn. Ecclesiastes 5, chapter 1. Go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 5, 1 says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. So say, look, when you go to church, you should be way more ready to hear. And, you know, hearing, obviously, because you'll be hearing the word of God and listening and learning, than to give the sacrifice of fools. So the people that come to church, and they, just, they, they think that, like, they're going to be justified because they're putting money in the offering plate, and they're just giving this sacrifice unto God, and they come, and they're going to live like hell the whole week, and then they're going to come in and just say, well, here, I'm going to put you know, $500 in the offering plate. That's going, to, that's going to go a long way. The Bible's calling that, that's the sacrifice of fools. He said, you ought to come be more ready to hear. You know, and I'm not downing giving, you know, putting money in the offering plate. It's not, that's not the point. The point is just that, you know, a lot of people, they're not ready to hear. They're not coming to church to hear the word preached and to learn and to grow and to get their root down and to understand more and to be able to serve God. You know, God doesn't want, um, God's not as interested with your physical sacrifices as he just is with your obedience to his word and just learning his word and doing it. God has some, some very simple commands for us to follow. Now, we might find it difficult because we're living in his flesh, but the commandments themselves are very simple. They're not that complicated. He expects us to follow, but he, and that's what he wants from us. He's not asking for some huge sacrifice of your own volition to do something. Now, if you want to do that, great. But he's more interested in just in your obedience and just in obeying his word and listening to him. And <clears throat> these are not things that you can just replace by doing them at home. You can't just... just um, do all these things that we mentioned with the church. You can't just do them all by yourself at home. Now, if you're in Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 11. Because we're going to see here the purpose here. It explains the purpose of pastors and teachers and evangelists. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So these are things that, these are the reason why he gave prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, apostles, for the perfecting of the saints. So the saints are those that are believers that, that are sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. The whole point of the pastors is to try to perfect you, to try to make you better, more complete in Christ and in obeying his word, for the work of the ministry. So for doing the work, for going out, winning souls to Christ, visiting the fatherless and the widows, in their affliction, doing, you know, doing the work of the ministry, ministry, serving other people. That's what ministering is. You're serving. And for the edifying of the body of Christ. So it's also to edify other people within the church. You need to go out and help people outside of the church. We need to edify the people within the church. And perfecting of the saints. So these are all reasons for, you know, that, that uh, pastors and teachers and prophets were all given was for these things. Now, it says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So by coming to church and learning and growing and hearing more, you're not going to be any more a child. Because a child, it's easy for a child to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Before you really learn a lot about the Bible, before you know very much, it's easy to be deceived because people are pretty slick and the devil's pretty slick. And he's going to come to you and say, well, look at this and this. You know, see, this is, you know, you can be God's too or whatever the false doctrine is. And a lot of times, if you don't, if you're not rooted down, if you don't, if you haven't learned, 
It's going to be easier for someone to, to be able to toss you to and fro and carry you about with every wind of doctrine. So anything that just, whatever way the wind's blowing, people are going to be able to say, oh yeah, well that sounds good to me, yeah, sure. But it's, but it's by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. People are doing this on purpose. They lie in wait to deceive. There's a lot of people out there trying to trick you and try to tell you that the Bible says something that it doesn't. So in order for that not to happen to you, you need to learn. You need to be reading the Bible and you need to be you know, coming to church and also in, in hearing this, you know, getting around other believers, edifying one another, doing the work of the ministry and, and getting perfected through church. Now, um, I'm almost done here. I'm going to close up. Go ahead and turn, if you would, please, to one more place. I'm going to turn to one more place. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. I got one point I'm going to skip here about marriage in the church. When you get time on your own, you can read Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 goes, goes into a great, there's a great passage about marriage and how marriage is equivalent to, to the church. And he describes, you know, the relationship between a husband and a wife is, is a picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. And when you get some time, we, I, I'm, I don't have enough time to go through it. It's in my notes, but i gotta, I got to skip that for now. Ephesians chapter 5, right near the end of the chapter there, kind of the latter half. You can read that on your own. It's a, it's a very good um, correlation between marriage and the church. And um, get that on your own time. But, you know, this church, we're meeting in a house. And a lot of people, you know, some people are scared of that. Some people don't like that. They expect a church to be a building, but I mean, a church is not a building. As we said many times already, it's a congregation. It's where people get together. The building means nothing. The building means absolutely nothing. When people, when the disciples said to Jesus Christ, they said, oh, look at these stones. You know, look at, look at how beautiful the temple is, basically. He's just like, see these stones? There's not one stone upon another. It's not going to be cast down. This is all going to be gone. I mean, this building, this structure that we're in, it means nothing. It's going to be, it's going to vanish away. It's going to be gone. The church, the people are what matter. The souls are what matter. The people that are here, that, that is what has eternal value. And that's why it doesn't matter where we're congregating, where we're meeting. And just to show you, though, I mean, the Bible says, I'm going to read three, three verses for you. All throughout the Bible, this is where, how church is met. This is how people met. We're in houses. It wasn't, it wasn't in some great fancy building. But in the New Testament, in Romans 16, 5, says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia and the Christ. Colossians 4.15 says, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. And Philemon 1.2 says, And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So don't let it bother you that we're meeting in a house. I hope it doesn't. It shouldn't matter. But, um, but you know, honestly, it's another reason. It's another excuse that people will give not to come to church and maybe not to come to this church. Because I write it plain out in an invitation. I don't want people to, to have a different expectation about this church when I go out and talk to people. I don't want to feel like I'm deceiving them or tricking them. I want them to know up front what we're all about. So I'll try to tell them as much as possible. Hey, we're a King James only Bible believing church. Hey, we believe that, you know, we believe salvation by grace through faith. I want people to know what we believe, but I also say, hey, we're meeting in the home of Pastor David Versons. This is where we're meeting. I don't want you to think, because I mean, some people have this idea in their heads. I'm not going to be deceptive about it because I don't think there's any reason to be. There's nothing to be ashamed about being in the church. But some people use that as an excuse not to come to church. They'll say, oh, well, well, it's in your living room. That's kind of weird. It's not weird at all. I mean, maybe in today's society it seems kind of weird because you have these mega churches that are just built and they have Starbucks in the cafeteria and they, you know, they sell all this stuff and, and it's this great big auditorium and you got the sound speakers and everything else and that's what they're used to. But there's nothing wrong with meeting in a house. The church is important. Jesus Christ shed his blood for the church. And, and, you know, he cares about the individuals. He cares about the people in the church way more than about the building. He doesn't care at all about the building. The building means nothing. And um, so don't let that be a, a distraction for you or something to, to take you out. But look, at, I'm going to close with this. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 15. He says, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church here is called the house of God. So this is God's house, and it's the pillar and ground of the truth. So the church is a place you can come, and this is the pillar. This is the ground. This is where the truth is. This is where you're going to want to be. This is where you ought to be making a priority to invest your time coming to church. 
It's a pillar and ground of the truth. And, and earlier in 1 Timothy 3, it explains the operation of the church, you know, the qualifications for a pastor and those types of things. But the Bible puts a lot of emphasis on the church. And we've read a bunch of scriptures this morning that explains that, look, Jesus Christ has blood for it. We're commanded not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We need to come and learn. We need to grow. I mean, it's, it's only, it is one aspect of your growth. It's one aspect of your Christian life. I'm not saying it's the only one. There's plenty of others. But it is a very important aspect coming to church. I mean, just, just simply being here. I mean, there would be no reason for me to come and, and, and try to start a new church and get something going if I didn't think it was important that people be here. You know, and, and you take that into consideration too. You've got someone here that's spending a lot of their time reading and studying and, and trying to learn as much as possible so that I can share this with you. Because I want you to grow and I want you to be better as well. I care about you. I care about everyone that comes to this church. And I'm devoting a lot of my time to try to help you out. I'm here to try to minister to your needs. And I want to help you. And, and you know, people and, and the pastors and, and the leaders and the people who do the preaching in, these, in other churches that are Bible-believing churches, they're doing the exact same thing. They care about the people that come. And... You could, I don't want to say, I don't know if I use the word respect, but, you know, show the gratitude, maybe even just, just showing up. I mean, coming to church, come and listen to what someone else has spent hours or, you know, years preparing to, to, to feed you, to, to help you, to help you to grow. And, and think of it as such, don't be, don't, don't let that slip away because there's people that are trying, that are really saying and, and, and want to help and want to explain things and want to show you things from the Bible to help you out, to help you in your day-to-day -day life. Church is important. Come and listen and don't, don't just, you know, be worried about what you're going to have for lunch. Listen intently on the Word of God and, and try to apply it in, in, in your life. And, um, I mean, make your best effort to, to be here, to be in church, to, to be around the other believers. And... Um, and, and to make it a priority for yourself right, in your own life. I, obviously, I made my own priorities. I'm going to be in church every day. When we go on vacation, we make it a priority. We're going to be in church. It's something we need to have. We don't want to slip. We don't want to fall back. We want to continue to grow no matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing. It's a priority. And, and I hope that you all will, will make that a priority for yourself. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this church. God, I thank you for the believers that are here, that, that we're all together with one mind in one place, dear God, and we're here to sing praises under your name, and um, we're here to, to just hear your word preached. God, I thank you for, for all the learning that's going on, and, and I pray that you would please just use me as a pastor to be able to, to teach well and to instruct through your word and truth, dear God, and um, I pray that you would please just stir up everyone's heart here to, to um, make church a priority. And not only just to come to church, but to be active in the church and to, to help others out and get to know people and, you know, really be able to edify others and minister unto other people and, um, and just experience the joy that, that you give us through helping others and, and, um, and just being around God's people, dear Lord. It truly is amazing and it's great, a great blessing. And I pray that you would please just help us all to, to just do that and to get rooted down in church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.